Before we get started in this episode, a quick announcement. As you know, I'm very passionate about acceptance and commitment therapy and I also run a busy practice in Canberra. We're currently looking for psychologists who are registered in Australia to join our team who are also passionate about learning about ACT. We provide supervision on a group and individual basis and training around ACT. So if this is you, if you're interested, please express your interest at strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers. Look forward to hearing from you. And now back to this episode. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name is Nesh Nikolic and my guest today is philosopher Professor Christy Miller to talk about the nature of time. Professor Miller took up an Australian Research Council postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Queensland in 2006. In July of 2006, Professor Miller moved to Sydney with the grant, and in 2009, she was awarded a University of Sydney DVC postdoctoral research fellowship. Since 2011, Professor Miller has been a senior ARC research fellow and is currently Joint Director of the Centre of for Time. Professor Miller joins me today to discuss the nature of time, perspectives of time, how we make decisions, and some fascinating empirical findings she has worked on. I really enjoyed this discussion as it stretched my mind and raised lots of questions for me to continue considering in my therapy and also in myself. Hope you enjoy the conversation. <music> Christy, a big thank you for coming onto the program today. Thank you for having me. Look, I'm always, I'm always interested to uh, pick pick someone's brains who's got you know plenty of experience, and 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 you're certainly one of those. I'm excited to have a you know, conversation in, in in the space around you know, time and perception of time and decision making around uh, from time to time how we do so with, with with biases. You know, biases is certainly one of my passions, more so from a clinical perspective when I'm you know working with clients, uh, but I think. Uh, uh, this will fit quite neatly into all of that as well. So thank you. Oh, pleasure. How did you get into in, in into this space? I'm always interested in, in in the journey that brings people to these you know interesting places because it's such a such a uh, specific thing to be researching and and know know about. And I know that you do a lot of other things too. But uh, how did you get into this space? Yeah, it is a bit unusual. Um, so, so I guess I should say that my background, I'm a philosopher rather than a psychologist. Um, so warning, <laughs> warning people, warning. Um, yeah, so my uh, I work primarily in kind of uh, metaphysics, which I guess I think of rather grandly as, you know, the study of all the things. Um, so one of the big areas in metaphysics is uh, the study of time and temporality and like, you know, what is time in itself? Mm -hmm. So I suppose I sort of started off there. I was kind of interested in the metaphysics slash physics of time. Um, and then a very natural kind of question arises, which is, uh, well, uh, there's all these ways we think about time. There's all these ways we experience time. And uh, when you're kind of theorizing about time in itself, there are these kind of big questions about, well, how much of that, how much of that kind of experience of time should we expect to be a feature of time itself should be, you know, expect to find out there in the world and how much of it is what we bring, how much of it is kind of um, subjective experience. So uh, I guess one way of thinking about that is uh, how much should we be thinking that um, we should be looking to psychologists to explain stuff and how much should we be thinking we should be looking to physicists to explain stuff. So that's kind of where I started and I became more uh, more interested in the kind of uh, subjective end of things. So more interested in, well, how do we experience time? Uh, what does that look like? How does that inform, uh, you know, our how our day-to-day -day living and our decision-making and our planning? And eventually that kind of led me to thinking about kind of temporal preferences and time biases and things like that and to do some. So I'm a philosopher, but um, at the Centre for Time, we do quite a lot of kind of empirical work. Um, sort of probing people's preferences and how they feel about stuff and what they think about stuff. Because um, as you're, as a philosopher, you have all these questions about like, what are people really like? 
And sometimes psychologists have answered those questions for us. Sometimes you run the exact experiment we want and we're like, yes, this is great. <laughs> and sometimes you you look around for the data that you're kind of looking for as a philosopher and you're like, wow, uh, psychologists have done really interesting work kind of in peripheral areas, but they haven't targeted quite the question that I really wanted answered. They've kind of answered a bunch of other questions. And so, um, yeah, so at the same time, we're like, well, look, if they're not going to do it, we're just going to have to step up to the mark here and do some work ourselves because it's, uh, yeah, it's often that philosophers are asking slightly different questions than um, other people want answers to. So that's kind of what led to some of our empirical work is just our desperation that no one else was asking and answering exactly what we wanted to know. Before we go into the subjective side, because uh, that's obviously the the, the interesting uh, part, is there a commonly accepted understanding of what the objective one is you know are we are we specifically trying to you know hone it down on it's the passage of time that's measured that can actually be measured so we you know we do it minutes seconds hours months days you know years so on um i didn't do that in chronological order uh or or, or is it still a little bit beyond that is, is it a bit more nuanced beyond that uh, no, it's massively controversial. Um, okay, of course. Of course. Very well, what little, was I thinking? <laughs> yeah, no, there's, I mean, especially in philosophy, right, because no two philosophers agree about anything. But, no, it's super controversial. It's um, it's controversial in, in myriad ways, all the way from whether temporality exists at all at a fundamental level. Um, so, you know, you've got your theories of quantum gravity. Um, is it an emergent phenomena? If it's emerge, if time is emergent, how does it emerge from a fundamentally non-temporal base? And then there's these, so that's controversial, uh, whether it emerges, how it emerges, whether it's fundamental. Uh, it's also uh, controversial what it's like. So assume that it does emerge and that there is temporality. Um, to what extent is it properly described by kind of theories like um, special and general relativity? What features does it have? Is there any genuine temporal passage or is it just a kind of um, static dimension? Uh, so there's kind of limit, there's limitless sources of uh, controversy um, out there about what time itself is like. So, so is there a definition of what time is? No. No. Wow. Uh, yeah. No. I mean, I, 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 I sort of feel like, well, in some sense, we kind of know it when we, we kind of know it when we run up against it. But no, that in in a way, there's not, and that's actually it's a very difficult question to even answer, right? So, if I set you the task of um explaining to someone who didn't know what time was like what what is this what is this thing and in particular if i said to you well look we've got a bunch of spatial dimensions and we've got a temporal dimension like explain explain to this person who has never experienced time like what is the difference between these things um you probably find it a lot harder than you might have thought uh kind of trying to get a handle on exactly what makes something time to begin with um, even if you, you know, even without access to any of the physics or any of those kinds of things, it's actually a really difficult job to even say what makes something temporal rather than, you know, spatial. Mm -hmm. which, which, which in many ways is why that overlap is so intriguing. I mean, the, you kind of can't answer one without the other. They're, they're, they're entwined. Right, because uh, a lot of uh, philosophers in particular and, and some physicists have thought that um, – that some physical theories uh, do better at kind of making sense of how time seems to us, kind of subjectively speaking, and they take that to be a reason to prefer some theories over others. And uh, I take that reasoning to be quite controversial, but um, it's a it's a genuinely interesting question what the connection is between the subjective and the objective, because uh, certainly we find that um some people think that various ways that you and I seem to experience time just are not well captured in the kind of physical models and the philosophical models of time uh and they think that you know that's a that's a reason to be suspicious of those accounts mm -hmm. gosh this is already um so complicated uh because I'm I'm just trying to reflect all of this in, in you know, internalize it and 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 understand the different components because i you know as you say we, we know what it's like to experience it you know we, we we set a time to to uh do this podcast and so we we can uh we can both put a 
put a marker in a tool that we have called a calendar and you know has it has uh, an understanding a mutual understanding we actually hold about when that will be and 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 uh and then we can kind of meet that and we do that throughout our entire lives. We, we, we can kind of move ahead in time by projecting we'll be, we'll, we'll both use the same measure. Uh, but that still doesn't answer the question of what is time. We're just saying I can put a point on this scale that we will come together, but uh, we're still asking the question of what is that scale? You know, where, where did it begin? Where does it end? Does it exist? Is this right. just the subjective yeah. thing that 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 we we have decided that we will put together, and so we'll, we we will create time by virtue of an agreement together of saying, you know, what are we going to do on a, on a on a Wednesday morning? Yeah, so we're very good at, um, as you say, we're we're quite good at planning. We're certainly good at um, thinking about the kind of uh, the timeline in in some you know fairly concrete way with calendars and so forth. We we are all tightly tied to our diaries these days. Um, so and we're 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 good at coordinating with other people, and uh, we're also pretty good at uh, sort of conceptualizing time in a, in a in a more abstract way and at projecting ourselves forwards and back. So you know we we have these um, capacities for kind of mental time travel, which are pretty distinctive. They might not be just they may not be um, capacities that only humans have, but they're certainly distinctively human capacities. We really are strongly able to kind of get episodic memory happening and really, you know, not only sort of take ourselves back into things that we've already experienced, but really project ourselves forward to a range of kind of different possible futures, which, um, you know, it's actually pretty kind of impressive to be it's the kind of thing that can kind of pull yourself out of the moment you're in and imagine yourself um, acting in other moments. And I think it gives us kind of distinctive capacities um, and, and very useful useful evolutionarily useful ones um but yeah as you say that doesn't sort of tell us it doesn't tell us what time is in itself um it tells us you know certain things about certain capacities we have um to kind of act uh temp temp temporarily <laughs> that's, i think that that's probably not a word uh but yeah, it doesn't it doesn't answer the questions about um time in itself and it leaves lots unsaid about sort of how we engage with time do you have a a working model of of what time is for yourself? I know that there's obviously d- different philosophers and and, and 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 physicists will will have different you know, thoughts and versions. Obviously, the 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 the, the, the um, there isn't one that is considered to be accepted by the whole. Do you have one that you hold in particular? Yeah, so the probably the biggest controversy in uh, in philosophy uh, at the moment is between people who think that uh, time really does pass and people who think that it really doesn't. Where what it means very roughly for time really to pass is that there's some kind of objective um, feature to time itself, such that uh, there's a fact of the matter about which moment and which events really are in the present and which are really past and which are really future and that that uh, those facts change. So this is a pretty intuitive way of um, thinking about time and temporality. Uh, probably if I asked you the question, um, you know, do you think this, do you think this moment is present? Uh, you'd probably say yes. And if I asked you about, you know, what happened yesterday and what's going to happen tomorrow, you'd probably say that yesterday was past and tomorrow is future. And you'd probably say that you have some view of time on which there's a kind of fact about all of the things that are present with us now. So you'd probably say, well, that there would be a lot of them, but in principle we could kind of list them all uh, and they would all be happening at the same time as we are um, uh, recording this podcast. And then you'd, you, you might think, uh, something further, which is like these moments are present now, but of course, in a second, new moments will be different moments will be present and different things will be present, right? Uh, so as time sort of marches on and uh, progressively different things become present and other things that were present become past and things that were future become present, right? So there's this kind of uh, genuine movement and flow of time, which kind of 
uh, maps onto what you might think of your experience of time because you might think, well, look, as we kind of wander around the world, we're experiencing this moment. We're being impacted sensorily by like all, all these things, the, the, the now things, right? So um, the the past things are not, well, the, the very past things are not causally or perceptually impacting us. I can't sort of, um, I can't causally or perceptually engage with stuff that happened yesterday. I can't sort of see yesterday's breakfast. I can't causally intercede on it. I can see today's breakfast, hopefully. Uh, and likewise for tomorrow, I can't, uh, can't kind of, causally engage with or see tomorrow's breakfast like until I get to tomorrow and then I can do that so there is this kind of um sense we have I think as we move around the world of there being this moment which is now which is the moment we're all experiencing and the sense that there's these past moments which we did experience but which are kind of done and dusted and gone gone the way of the dodos and that there are these kind of future times and future things that we're going to experience which we are kind of moving towards and when they're positive things you have this kind of positive you know, anticipatory state, which is like, oh, tomorrow's, you know, uh, great uh, meal at the restaurant is coming, you know, at six o'clock tomorrow. And as as time is passing, it's becoming ever closer. I'm getting closer to that tasty, tasty meal. It's going to become present. I'm going to have, you know, the 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 great Japanese custard and I'm going to have the, you know, the chocolate pudding. It's, you know, you're kind of imagining this and it gets closer, you get more excited. And then then it's there and you're there and you're in the restaurant and you're eating your custard and you're like, yes. This is the present custard is the good custard, right? And then sadly, at the end of the meal, it's gone. Like it's it's receded into the past. And as you keep going, it becomes further and further away and becomes this kind of memory. Uh, and I think we uh, we often do experience, like that seems like an apt description of the things that we experience. And on some ways of thinking about time, that really is how things are. So time really is kind of moving in that way such that future things are coming towards you, they're becoming present and then they're kind of receding. So that's a, uh, it's a view uh, and it's not a view that I have. So um, the, I guess the alternative picture is one on which everything is static. Nothing, nothing's moving. You and I aren't going anywhere. Time isn't going anywhere. Nothing's moving relative to anything. All that's happening is that there's a kind of giant block of space time and time itself is one just one dimension in that block and the spatial dimensions are also um just yet more dimensions and nobody's moving in the block nothing's flowing things are not coming closer to us or getting further away um it's just that you and i uh, exist at multiple locations in that block so we exist at this location having this conversation we exist in a few moments having the, the next bit of the conversation we exist at earlier locations having different bits of the conversation and i guess the right way to think about it maury is that um you have lots of kind of selves scattered throughout this giant block of space time and at each moment um each of those selves is kind of having its own set of experiences so uh, on this view, it's not as though my uh, my younger self is somehow gone, you know, in some objectively real past. It's out there just like me, and so are all my future selves. Uh, we're all just located somewhere in the block. It's just that the particular self that I am now is having the experiences I'm having and all my other selves are having the experiences they are having. Um, but it's not that... Um, it's not that time is passing and future events are kind of coming closer and then receding. And this is a very different picture. It's a, it's a more foreign picture. It's, it's much less how we, I think, naturally think about and conceptualize and talk about uh, the temporal dimension. That poses a question for me, probably many, but the one that stands out is with the space time block, assuming uh, that that is one thing so it, it just is do you and i consistently exist in all the entirety of the space-time block so that uh if i'm at the same place in uh in, in multiple places at the same time my consciousness only follows the one that I'm aware of at the moment, which is my, my space time block at the moment is speaking with you. Uh, am, I, am I capturing this? Cause I'm when, when you say to me, like it's the space time block and look, I'm, I'm a, uh, amateur, uh, science lover. Um, so 
I always think about that that graph of the sheet of paper that you know can can bend you know warps in 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 the middle if you put like a marble and it kind of stretches so it kind of says the whole of the thing is 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 space but you can fold itself together and so you can this is kind of how it you know allows for movement to occur but we're not really even saying movement because we're 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 not saying that you're coming closer or further away at any given time it's just the thing that we perceive i suppose or or, um yeah i think i'm just getting a uh, getting myself into a knot here but it, it seemed to me like when you when you said that 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 there's a space time block and we experience is it like all of it uh so i guess there's two separate questions here so obviously uh you and i uh only exist at certain bits of the block so uh i've been watching david attenborough's um prehistoric planet planet so that's set yeah. like 65 million years ago uh Clearly, so you and I are not around back then. So uh, maybe a good way of thinking about it is something like let's imagine that we are kind of God, uh, or we could, or you know, just a, just somebody who's kind of existing outside of space time, kind of um, in their own little realm, looking down at the totality of our universe, and we can ask the question like, what are they seeing? Like, what is what's down there, man? Right. Uh, and the answer is something like, well, they're seeing a, a very lo- extremely large. Uh, kind of a four dimensional block. So they'll look down and kind of um, let's imagine they're looking from a perspective, which is a, a bit misleading, but let's imagine they look down and on the far left, they see the big bang. So uh, you know, there'll be a big bang, assuming there was a big bang and they'll see uh, that the, the universe is kind of spatially um, growing, but uh, as God kind of scans across the totality of the kind of temporal dimension of the block, basically is, what God is, see is, is the Big Bang the, the center of it? No, it's at one end, right? It's, it's on the, one end. Okay, it's, okay. So it's, a, it's at one. Okay, that that that. So it's yeah. That okay. Keep going. So yeah. So the so the Big Bang is at one end, and let's let's suppose our universe has an end. So maybe in fact our universe is temporally infinite, but let's suppose it's not. Let's suppose that there's a big kind of a big crunch at the other end. So now um, the person outside of space time is kind of looking down, and they can see just one giant block. And what they'll see along the kind of temporal dimension is uh, all of the things that have ever happened. So you know. Uh, towards the left, they'll see a bunch of dinosaurs, and then a bit later, they'll see. Well, later in the block, they'll see a, kind of an asteroid uh, is there in the block. Um, unfortunately for the dinosaurs, you know, colliding with the with planet Earth. Uh, and as as God sort of looks at uh, more of the block towards the the right hand side of things, uh, I guess uh, God will see you know humans evolving. And at some point, God will be looking down and they'll be like, you, you and I will be there in the block, you know, we'll be born. Uh, and so uh, our our whole lives are, are in the block from the moment we're born to the moment we die. Uh, and we're kind of smeared. We're effectively smeared across this four-dimensional block so that at what you and I would think of as every instant at which we exist and have, you know, lived our lives will be there already baked into the block. So the block is kind of like a giant loaf of bread or a cookie or something. Uh, everything that ever happens is just there in it. Um, and so, yeah, so um, every moment of our lives is there and every moment of our consciousness is there. So some people, uh, I think, misimagine the block as one in which kind of uh, our whole lives are there, but only one moment is kind of conscious. So they're almost imagining that something is moving. They're imagining that the kind of consciousness is moving. So it's almost a picture. That's what I'm struggling with. And and that's why I'm I'm trying to go, if, if, if my whole experience exists, uh, but I'm only feeling the one moment, uh, or am I, or are we saying that? Because uh, in that block, we've got the big bang and then we've got, uh, something ahead that we don't know what is, but we've certainly know our present moment. Um, uh, and so obviously there, there's my birth date, there's my present moment, and there's going to be a time when I pass. Uh, right. So my little bit is, is is there and my grandma's bit is there that's passed and and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and that when they overlap, it's lovely. We call them family. Uh, when they don't, they're strangers. 
uh, uh, I can only ever experience my present. Well, your present self only ever experiences its present, present right? So, so there's no – because there's no objective fact about which moment is present, all of yourselves are out there having all of their experiences, right? So there's no sense in which – uh, your consciousness is moving. There's no sense in which only one bit of you, i.e., the now bit, is conscious. Um, all of your, all of yourself. So let's suppose that um, yesterday you decided to do some carpentry, but you're not a very good carpenter, and so uh, the hammer and your finger collided, causing some painful, um, you know, some painful things in the hand. Uh, it's uh, and that's that that version of yourself is relative to you now. It's in the past. Um, What's the kind of status of the, the conscious experiences there? Well, on this view, um, that self is still is there, still in the block, right, um, at the earlier time, having whatever those painful experiences are. So let's suppose you hit your finger and you, you know, you shouted out some <laughs> rude word uh, as that, that hurt. Well, that those events and those pains, uh, they're still there. So it's not, it's not like they kind of uh, go away. Because after all, um, there's no fact about this current self being present, right? There is no present. On this view, there is no presentness. Um, there's no fact about uh, you and I really being present and your yesterday's self with the with the um, injured finger being passed. Uh, everything is just there in the block um, in a kind of unchanging fashion. So from your current perspective, your yesterday self is past because it, it is, in fact, earlier than where you are. But that's a merely perspectival and subjective fact sure. because your self from two days ago is also in the block. And from its perspective, it's also having conscious experiences, yeah, right? Okay. From, its expect, it, from its perspective, your yesterday self is in the future. It's still uh, it's uh, uh, something that's being anticipated and is, uh, is later than. So uh, it's sort of maybe a way of thinking about it is like those old um, old fashioned advent calendars you get when you're a kid and they have all of the days leading up to mm. Christmas with little windows and you get to open the window and kind of see what's in there. Well, you could think of the advent calendar at each of the little windows as being yourself kind of at a, at a moment of time. And now imagine just opening all the little advent windows and in each window, there's a self having its own experiences, seeing like seeing out through the advent calendar and it's seeing whatever it can see from its perspective because of course it can't see everything it can only see kind of the the stuff that's perceptually impinging on it and so a way of thinking about this is that uh there's all each of these little selves in a little in the advent calendar looking out their own window having their own experiences and seeing their own um you know ways things are and they're all equally real they all uh have equal status uh, of course, each of them is kind of bounded in certain kinds of ways. They can't always talk to one another um, perfectly, but they're all you. They're just you at different times and you having different experiences and you, you taking different perspectives and no one of them is special by being genuinely present. So that's that's my, that's my view about um, you and I as selves and how they sort of connect to time. Yeah. I think where I'm tripping over myself is that when I – take the position of the God observer. I look down and I see all the Advent moments in the calendar. And so I can see the, the you know, the uh, 24 pockets that, 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 that are to be opened or the 24 selves. Uh, and, and, and those 24 selves all exist at the same time. And well, not, even- at the, not at the same time, right? They don't exist at the same time because the block – uh, I mean, so that's both a, it's a kind of a, a potentially, it's a potentially misleading way of putting it right because one of the dimensions of the block is time. So none okay. of those, neither of those two selves is existing at the same time because one of them is on Monday, the next one's Tuesday, the next one's Wednesday. So it's not like two selves. Sorry, my, my apologies. Yeah, I, I, what I should say is they, they all exist. They all exist. Right. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. They all exist. Uh, yeah, because it's just it's one block, right? Uh, yes, yeah. That's but right. It's, it's and as the totally, observer, yeah. that's right. As the observer, I look down and I see a big block, and in there, there, uh, there are twenty-four selves, right? 
and that's where we kind of get into a, a bit of a, a a challenge of saying that's the observer of 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 the whole. But then if I step into the advent calendar, at that point I'm saying I am rather than the observer, the God observer, I, I'm saying I am this moment. Uh, you know, so I exist through this consciousness rather than the observer consciousness that looks at the whole, I become the actual granular I. Uh, and and in there is where it, it kind of says I can see what I experienced in the past. I can plan for my future, and it feels like I'm now on a time scale, rather than when I'm as the observer, where I've stepped back the God sort of experience. I I don't see the dimension of time. I just see the space time block. Right. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. And and you're right that when you like when you want to be in the advent calendar, as it were, yeah. You, um, if you if you were trying to make that decision, uh, you would you have to sort of parachute yourself into one of those windows, and you then have to be the kind of thing that takes a perspective. So, uh, and that, that can't sort of see the whole thing from this atemporal perspective. And so, I think that's absolutely right that that. Uh, that's a kind of important characteristic of our experience is that we are not like that godlike creature. We, we, you know, we we don't see things from outside space time necessarily. So because we are in fact in the block, and for any creature in the block, you are kind of necessarily looking out through the window of your own perspective, like through the place that you happen to be located, and that's what uh, gives our experiences the sort of characteristics that they have that the fact that it is kind of perspectival in that way but also something that you you quite rightly said which is that um we have a very different relationship with our sort of past selves to our future selves which uh it might be in part what explains why people are inclined to think that they're sort of moving because as you rightly note, like when we put you into the block and you look out through a perspective, it's not just that you see the stuff around you, like you see these things in this house rather than the things I was seeing yesterday, although that's true too. It's also that uh, you and I have all these memories of what we did uh, previously uh, in a way that we don't have uh, memories of future states. So we we, ha- we are um, bear very asymmetric relations to past and future selves, uh, which gives our experience a very particular kind of character, right? So we sort of, um, we're highly kind of narrative creatures and in a way kind of understanding our current perspective and what we're looking out at and interpreting what we're looking at is uh, incredibly um, affected by where we've come. So I have all of these memories of what all of these past selves did, what perspectives they took, um, and that all um, has a huge impact on the, like who the current self is and what they see and how they interpret those things. And then when I'm sort of looking forward, I can't do, I, like I, you know, I, I can't remember <laughs> in inverted commas, like what tomorrow's self is going to do. Instead, what I, all I can do is kind of um, I can anticipate and I can sort of, I can plan and I can project forward in some ways. I can sort of imagine how things will go and I can imagine various different ways things will go, but it's a very different sort of relationship I have with my future self than my past self, right? I just, I know my past self in myriad ways that I don't know my future self, but equally I kind of, um, you know, I I really get to shape my future self in a way that my past selves have kind of shaped me. And I think these, some of these kind of features of, uh, which are very fundamental features, which are partly the result of thermodynamics and various things in the physics and then various things about evolution. But I think um, these things make a huge difference to kind of how we understand ourselves and how we think about ourselves and like what we're doing and how we end up forming preferences and how we reason about what we should or shouldn't do to and for our future selves, uh, particularly because like there's there's very little we can do to and for our past selves, right? So, you know, if we treated yesterday's self poorly uh, by, you know, doing some carpentry that we really were not equipped to do, that there's, there's no, uh, there's nothing we can do about that now. So you can kind of reflect on, man, that was a poor decision. Um, my poor yesterday self 
uh, got really hurt. And what's more, my thumb still hurts, right? My, I'm, I'm still feeling the effect of that. But there's nothing you can do to unwind that, that that's done and dusted. But we, you know, our, our future selves are kind of causally downstream from us. So there's a ton of stuff we can do that um, causally impacts them. So, uh, you know, there's a lots of people from lots of different, you know, economics, psychology, philosophy, uh, unsurprisingly, very interested in the question about like, well, how should you think about your future selves? How should you think about kind of what your duties are to them, given that they, you know, you have a huge impact on how, how life goes for them. And yet in some sense, they're kind of, um, they are sort of strangers. They're, they're temporal strangers. They're kind of, you know, they're, they're over there in the block. When you're uh, describing all of that, I, I look at it from the psychologist world and certainly from the acceptance and commitment therapy world of the difference between the conceptualized self, which is uh, one that judges. So one one that goes out and, and, and judges, so sees the past, sees the future, makes uh, comparisons and, you know, obviously from the psychological work can critique those and then get upset. The observer is the part of you that can step back from judgment and, and just witness. And so it, it, it's not a judge, it's a silent witness. And so it sees the space time block. And so often when someone is caught up in, for example, the judgment space or the conceptualized space, uh, they get caught up in, for example, thoughts. And so if a young person has a thought which says, you know, I'm a loser or nobody likes me, the observer would say, I'm having the thought, nobody likes me. So it it, it sees that a thought exists, but it doesn't then judge the thought it doesn't get involved in the thought so it steps back it just witnesses the thought you know i am having a thought it might right. even say thank you mind and so the the observer versus the conceptualized self and the conceptualized self has uh, uh both great value in terms of if we have a you know flexible robust um uh, conceptualized self that that you know, can can at least feel helpful and 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 uh, have that flexibility model, so it creates less distress. Um, that can be helpful, but we don't want to hold a real firm conceptualized self because if I tightly hold myself as being a psychologist, uh, what happens if I have an accident and I can't? do my work anymore because of a brain injury or something or other, then it shatters that whole conceptualized self. And because that's a judgment space, it says being a psychologist is important. You know, it, it's, it, it has value and, and, and it's meaningful and so on. The observer says, I am. And so I, I, I can hear those, those, those things and I've kind of drawn while you were talking two spaces, you know, the, the observer, which is kind of like that godlike experience, uh, and that's the whole continuous. So that, that that is the space time block, and then you've got the conceptualized self, which actually says, "I'm going to become part of the advent calendar, and and I'm going to put myself in one of those, and I'll see my past, and I'll see my now, and I'll see my future, and and I'll play on that realm, um, and 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 there's in actual fact." value of being able to hold both you know, to live in a practical sense i need to be in the conceptualized self to a degree you know the, yeah, uh, know that. yeah and so i need that to to kind of engage in in this conversation and functionally in life and and, and meet people and so on and so forth and then there's other times where it's really helpful to kind of um uh, give myself a shake and step back and become the observer and go, oh, wow, maybe these things that I'm dealing with on the conceptualized realm, 
when I step back and I just become the observer, then actually not that big. I don't have to kind of get caught up in that content. Um, you know, the big, the big picture scenario, it's kind of like, you know, someone who's worried about everything and, and and they're wrestling with, with life and challenges and responsibilities. And then something awful happens and they kind of step back a bit and they look at their sort of values or they go, nothing actually matters. That might be one extra layer where they reduce judgment. Um, maybe they connect a bit, a bit more with values, but the observer, the space time block is actually beyond that again it's it, it's that witness it, it doesn't say um yeah it doesn't doesn't uh put in uh the content of those thoughts it, it just sees those thoughts um that's the way that's kind of how i might my brain's working while you're talking <clears throat> yeah so that that's a nice kind of analogy and i mean Obviously, none of us really can extract ourselves from space time and kind of look from that totally disembodied perspective. But uh, yeah, I think we can kind of imaginatively engage with sort of pulling ourselves out of the 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 temporal perspective we have and kind of imagining our our whole lives. And uh, I definitely think that that can. Um, I mean, I don't know if there's kind of actual research on this, but uh, I certainly think that taking that perspective can be uh, kind of useful and um, and sort of therapeutic uh, for a, a bunch of, you know, it's, it's certainly something that I deliberately do at times. So I think when we're kind of embodied and we have the very, you know, the perspective that we have, the, the, the things around us are very salient. So whatever's happening now is really the thing that you're attending to because, after all, it's the thing that the current self is kind of has, has to be engaging with because that's, you know, um, that's what sort of makes you the current self you are having the perspective that you do. But it's very easy to kind of get um, caught up in the the current thing, especially if they're, you know, a bit distressing or stressful or whatever. And um, there's nothing you can do to kind of, uh, in some sense, remove yourself from the current, you know, the current self just has the perspective that it has. It's not like it can go somewhere else. But I, I totally agree with you that um, sometimes by, by realising, or at least, you know, I, I try and take the perspective of trying to kind of pull myself out a little bit from the current perspective and sort of imagining myself and imagining all of the different selves from the different perspectives. And what that does in a way is um, on the one hand, when you look back at your past selves, you realise that each of those had its own perspective too and it each, each of those selves had their own challenges and their own, you know, stressors and bad things and, uh, and what's more, given given the way I think about the, these things, um, you know, those selves are all kind of still out there. But what you learn by being at your current perspective is that you know they they coped, they they got through things. You know, you you, you are where you are kind of now, and because according to this sort of block way of thinking about things, your future selves are out there too. So, you know, things might be, you know, maybe looking out through your current perspective now is a bit bleak in various ways, um, a bit challenging. I find it sort of um, uh, reassuring in a weird way to think, well, my, my future selves, it's not like they aren't there yet. It's sort of, it's not like there's a blank canvas, which is to be written on, which I think many people kind of like the idea of. I as I have this sense, oh, look, my self, future selves are out there and they're all, they've already coped in a way. So like, uh, you know, tomorrow's self is there and she's already over whatever this current unfortunate, you know, aspect of this perspective is like, she's there. And so is the day after. And so is the day after. And there's actually something quite uh, relieving about that, uh, that you think, um, you know, uh, you've already in, in some weird sense of already, I mean, it's future, but it, it's, um, it's sort of, it's, it's happened. Um, and yeah, so I, I find that, um, kind of, uh, sense of security, a sense of, uh, yeah. uh, 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 sense that the hard time that you might be experiencing in actual fact, uh, has been, has already been resolved because there right. is a future self that has right. resolved that. And, and so the, yeah. it, it, it's comforting. To, to, to know that it's, it's interesting because even when we talk about the selves 
it's almost like there's, and, and this is probably where, where there's a cross section with time as well, is there's a current physical and then there's a current mental and, yeah. and in, in the psychological space, you know, we, we, we try and spend as much time as we can looking at the current mental um, uh, because most of the, most of the angst and anguish doesn't actually come from the current physical because the, the, the current physical is usually not uncomfortable. For example, mm. we don't have uh, something that is traumatizing our body. You know, we don't have a, a, a steak going through our leg or, you know, a, a hot, hot, you know, burning sensation that, that, you know, from a lighter or something or other. Uh, what we do have though is mental thoughts mm. of, you know, demands of the life, what's coming up, uh, what's going to happen. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're kind of caught up in these thoughts yeah. And so much of our, our angst and pain and our suffering is us wrestling with thoughts, you know, assumptions, judgments, um, uh, thoughts about how, how the world will unfold. Um, and interestingly, even, even that other private mental experience, which I'd call sensations, uh, because they're not something that we can always observe. Like we, we can certainly see a sensation of like heat, um, that but that would be a, have to come from a physical sense at least from a you know if we look at the physics side but then we've got the sensations which are the emotional ones so you know it might be for example pressure on my chest okay? uh, movement in my stomach many people these days uh, 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 find it difficult to hold and make space for pressure on their chest or the sensation not the physical pressure the sensation of pressure on their chest or the sensation of movement in their stomach uh, and and maybe there is a physical side of senses in you know maybe the, your, there is a bowel movement for example uh, but interest or, or there might be muscles that are tensing in your chest uh, but at that point we would say that they're uncomfortable with bowel movements and muscle tension uh, and so we're trying to reframe and, and understand it. So, so, so much of what we're afraid of, what we're trying to escape, what we're trying to remove is, is discomfort, you know, where, where it feels uneasy. And all of that is obviously on the, on that um, you know, present moment, but it's, it's a present moment of the physics of the mental, not necessarily the physical. Yeah, that's right. I mean, because we are such, um, you know, highly cognitive creatures with all these, all these gazillions of memories of what has been, which we carry, which, um, you know, are affecting how we are now, but also this kind of um, a sort of dual attitude towards the future, which is on the one hand there's this kind of uncertainty because although it, even if even if your future selves are all out there, like you don't know what's happening to them and, you know, what they're doing. Um, so there's this this kind of um, uncertainty about what will happen, which is discombobulating in a weird way. But on the other hand, there's also uh, alongside the uncertainty, there's the fact that um, you know that you will be uh, shaping those future selves and kind of causally impacting on them, but but often in ways that you you can't predict. So there's a there's a sort of uncertainty about how things will go. There's the sense that uh, you bear some responsibility for these future selves, but um, it may not always be clear like what the right actions are now that will make life go better for them. Um, and so that could be, that can be sort of um, difficult. And I guess in, in addition, there's kind of um, there's trade-offs, right? So uh, one nice thing about thinking about like taking this kind of external perspective and thinking about all these selves is that what you see is that they don't always have, um, they it's, they're a kind of you can think of them as a kind of a, a colony of of little of little short-lived uh, people. Like each of them uh, um, short-lived just in that they they are kind of um, bound to a particular time and perspective. And I think sometimes in our lives, when we are looking out from the perspective of any of one of those selves, we sort of just imagine that 
um, where there's kind of one coherent thing that sort of, ex- you know, exists through time. And we're, we're just kind of thinking about, well, look, what should I be doing? How should I be planning for the future? How should I be making sense of my life? And we kind of, we almost think of it as, as if uh, we are the product of some giant narrator who's creating this nice kind of co- co- consistent and coherent story. But I think another way of thinking about it is, look, there are a whole bunch of these different selves and they have different projects and different preferences and they care about different things. And in a way they are, um, they're not all on board for the, for the same giant, you know, big overarching narrative. They, they may actually be in competition. So that there are often kind of scarce resources and there are questions about like how to distribute those resources across those various different selves. And they're kind of more like, um, you know, sometimes more like uh, a kind of loose group of people who are kind of trying to negotiate for a, a group outcome, but where people have uh, different um, different preferences and different priorities. And it's a bit more competitive because it's more like, well, um, the more stuff I get, the less stuff you get. Now, it's not always like that with selves over time, but it can be a little bit, right? So, you know, if I give you a bunch of resources now, you can make some decisions about how to distribute them across your current self and the various future selves. So you could just use those resources. If I give you a bucket of my marked resource, you could just be like, right, I'm going to go to town here, people. This this current self is going to just party hard on these resources and I'm going to use them all and tomorrow's self and the later selves are not going to get any of them, right? That's just, that's a decision you can, in fact, make, assuming, uh, assuming the resources are not <laughs> so massive you can't use them all in a day. Uh, or you could say, well, I'm going to use half these resources and half of them I'm going to let all of my future selves have. Like that's still a lot to you and less to them, but it's, you know, a bit more distributed. Or you can think about other ways of kind of distributing those. So you could even be like, okay, I'm not using any of these. I'm going to put these away in the cupboard uh, and tomorrow's self or next year's self or the self after can have those things. And, of course, we do these things all the time. Right now, presumably, you are putting around, you know, superannuation away into an account and not using it. Well, of course, that is just to take resources that you could be using now and effectively give them to your future selves. And so we kind of make these decisions all the time. And in a way, it's this kind of weird negotiation between you and your other selves, although you, you can't really talk to them, which is actually a bit of a pain in the ass because it would be <laughs> it would be way better, right, if you could talk to, um, you know, a 70-year-old self and be like, what do you really need, mate? Like what, you know, but we do this all the time. We have to make decisions about kind of how to use the resources we have and there's big questions about what the right way to do that. You know, how much saving should I be doing for my future selves? Like uh, I think all of us care to some extent about our future selves. No, none of us want to imagine ourselves at some future time as kind of uh, paupers without any resources, having a really bad life. I think n- none of us are kind of invested in that future. On the other hand, um, each self is kind of selfish, right? We 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 do feel the pull of wanting to do stuff now mm, and mm. rather than keeping resources for future selves. So, you know, given some incredibly tasty piece of food, we are really, we're super tempted to eat that, to, for the, to give it to the current self rather than be like, oh, tomorrow's self could have this. Um, so uh, one virtue of the block is that instead of just thinking, there's this this one coherent self with a coherent set of projects that we all care about and that we're all, you know, that myself at all these different times cares about Uh, and then being kind of confused and frustrated and puzzled that uh, we don't always get optimal outcomes because other selves sometimes don't pursue the projects that we started or don't, you know, save money or don't do the things that we might hope. And that can lead us to being like, what the hell is going on here? If you kind of, if you conceive of things a little bit more as, look, there are all these different selves, they don't all even agree about what's valuable. They don't all agree about what we should be doing, what projects are the best projects, let alone, you know, um, agree about how much money they should be saving. Thought of like that, you kind of see why you see that there are these different interests and it's less, um, it's less surprising that sometimes uh, we we don't look like these super coherent things over time. It's less surprising that we don't always do the thing that our future selves might have wanted us to do because 
sometimes we do the thing we want to do and not the thing that they kind of wish that we had done. And thinking of us as these loose collections of selves that, yeah, we have common, we often have common goals, but not always. And in a way, we're kind of competing. We're a little bit, we're, we're trying to figure out like how to distribute resources in a, in a way which is, um, good enough for the other selves but you know also gives me the current self what i want i can see the value in 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 that if someone can adopt that 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 position because it really starts to bring up that conversation or at least consideration of self-care what am i investing in today for for a, a future self um and even that's a nice concept that there's a future self rather than it's me um, you know, just that little play of, of, of perception can can be valuable. Um, I know that obviously in, in in psychology we do we often might go back and 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 talk about you know the the um, younger self or uh, uh, you know be able to potentially in your mind's eye observe a little you, um, and we might even kind of say you know that little girl or that little boy. So that you know, we, we you kind of change your relationship with those things, and when 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 you're changing the relationship, you might kind of make different decisions. You might be you know, less harsh on them if they're a little person, uh, or you might kind of be able to invest in 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 someone else. You know, the the future me. Um, uh, but uh, it it's yeah, Jesus is so complex, and I think it's really complex. I, I'm finding it complex and. You, you you rattle it off so easy. I mean, obviously you've got you've got that capacity. I find it really complex because each of the different uh, terms are so complicated. Like every time we use the word time, I struggle because I'm like, from what perspective? You know, uh, do we hold it as the witness? Do we hold it as the conceptualized self in that moment? When we use the word moment, I'm like, is that a moment that is uh, has a start, a finish, and an end, and then there's moments all the way through that as well that infinitely, you know, can, can, can be broken down, or is it kind of like day by day? So my head struggles to follow this. It's it, it's so complex, yet it seems to me like it's so important to be able to see both that that. There's, there's the experience of time where you and I, we can schedule it. We've got kind of like a, uh, a measure that we've both agreed on so that we can plan our lives. And uh, I can see there being a measure of, of uh, how I experience each of those moments, whether it be physical or the mental experience. And I think, I think we predominantly live in a mental world rather than a, physical world uh, at least that's that's where we shine the light we certainly live in a physical world, but i think we shine our light our perspective is 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 mainly in the mental world i'd have to believe that if i'm a psychologist uh, uh, but then how we make decisions uh, with these times i think there's such value of that that observer that non-judgmental witness uh, versus the judgmental person um uh, is 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 really um has some really important uh, therapeutic values i think to or, or efficacy around it to to be able to step back uh, from that and 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 also be able to lean in and say i've got an opportunity in this moment you know rather than trying to project forward or project back and be caught up in the past i can try and be present here and now um and still on a base of what are my values, I can still be informed by past selves uh, and then say, what are my values for future selves? So, uh, but it, Jesus is, this is really hard. Yeah. I think, I, I think that's, that's all, that's all right. And um, I think we're, we're, um, we're not bad at doing these kinds of things in, in kind of practical terms. So certainly I mean, Maybe maybe we don't often totally take the kind of total the the, the observer perspective. Um, Rarely, I'd say. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I, I I guess I 
I probably do it a bit, but but um, maybe it's maybe it is not. Maybe we don't do it a lot. I guess what we maybe maybe the closest thing, or maybe something that's related, is that we do um, rather than taking the kind of external perspective. What we do do is try and take the perspective of um, our different selves at different times. So. Uh, rather, I guess it, it, it's it's different. It's not the same as kind of taking the observer perspective and kind of seeing that there are all these selves kind of, you know, down there at different times with their perspectives. Um, but I guess one thing we do do is um, try and shift our, our perspective so that we are no longer looking out from the particular time we're at. We try and shift perspectives to be looking at it other times. And I suppose that's sort of a way of imaginatively, it's it's not the same as taking this kind of almost unembodied a perspectival um, view, but I guess what it does allow you to do is um, instead of always being trapped in the, the the perspective that you have at the current moment, it does allow you to take the perspective of different yes. selves at different times. And even though that's not the same as kind of looking at them from the external perspective, it does give you a kind of important um uh, sense of there being these other selves, but also this, you know, important sense of them having this quite different perspective from you. And it's pretty easy to do for past selves, but I think we're also, um, you know, we certainly have that capacity to do it for future selves as well. And I think that's a kind of important kind of capacity because just allowing yourself to realise in a way that, um, the perspective you have now is not the perspective. It's not the place you'll always be looking out from, um, and it's not uh, it's not some kind of special privileged perspective. It's just kind of one perspective among many that your various different selves will have. And realizing that um, it doesn't always require kind of taking this super this super disembodied kind of perspective. It can be enough, I think, to realize to kind of um, to put yourself in the in the place of looking out from the various different perspectives of yourselves and and seeing that that perspective will change and seeing that your values on your projects and your preferences will change, um, that's obviously a really important thing to do and something that's um, obviously it gives you a a new perspective because you're taking these various different perspectives and I think we are pretty uh, pretty good at doing. I mean. Obviously, we're limited. There's only so much you can do by way of um, putting yourself in alternative perspectives. But we definitely have that capacity, and I think that's a super important kind of capacity with respect to your future selves. Seems like there's uh, three selves in 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 some sense. There's a physical self, which we obviously live live in daily in this body. Um, is it, and, and that's kind of like a changing self. And I, I imagine that physics would say, yes, we can see that. We can see atoms, you know, uh, being removed and we eat atoms and then they get absorbed and then they get removed and, and around and around we go and we age, you know, we can see it visually in our face and our hair and so on and so forth. There's a thinking self, that, that sort of mental uh, self, which is forever changing as well. There's always different mental representations where we're doing this at the moment, having different thoughts arise, um, sharing the thoughts with one another. Uh, and in many ways we can kind of take different viewpoints, you know, we, 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 with the thinking selves. And then there's the observer, which is potentially somewhat connected with a thinking self, but it, it's an understanding that there is a witness inside us as well that that is also another part of the self there, there, there's a witness that can witness the thinking self hmm. and if you can see your thoughts you cannot be your thoughts yeah no and, I think that's and, right so there's and, yeah there's the yeah self and so on that yeah. basis yeah you, you there, there's an observing self which maybe we could say it's unchanging it's just it just exists it just is uh and then you've got the physical self, the thinking self, that are the changing selves, you know, and, and and then obviously our life comprises of all three or consciousness comprises of of all three. Because if I were to remove the physical, well, my apologies, even that's a theory. That that that's that, that even lies within the thinking self. Um, and that's part of the problem. We're trying to define things without actual answers um, because we, 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 we can't. Life is uncertain. It is. Yeah, no, but I think I think that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. Where where can 
where can we find it, find out more? Is there text that, that, uh, can uh, or, or, or you know online resources or, or journals, writings, books that can help with trying to understand some of what we've discussed. Is it comes through various different books because we're we're trying to integrate physics, we're trying to integrate psychology, we're trying to integrate philosophy. Um, you know all, all these you know religion even potentially once we start stepping into uh, well. Yeah, I think that, that that's in in there as well. Any any thoughts that you know what would be a good place to continue this conversation? Well, the Center for Time, which is where we do this kind of research, um, has its own uh, website, which is uh, centerfortime.org. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has sort of descriptions of some of the projects that we have and uh, even some of the empirical work that we do. Um, so that's sort of one one location and then um philosophers are uh, highly organized people so they have a website called um fill papers and uh all of what, what my was that what, what's it called sorry fill papers fill papers okay yeah uh so so uh obviously there's big issues with um with academic work being behind you know paywalls and journals and various things which can can potentially make things difficult for um, if you don't have some kind of institutional affiliation, it's not always possible to get hold of um, academic work without paying money. But uh, Field Papers um, is a fantastic website because um, certainly all of my papers and, you know, um, m- most of many people's papers are freely available from that website, freely downloadable. Um, so, yeah, so any anything of mine is, including stuff that's not published yet, um, is available there. It's very easy. It's a very easy search tool um, and, you know, other other folks. So, yeah, those would be two two places where you can sort of start um, looking for stuff if one is interested. And can you talk me through some of the 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 interesting work that comes out of out of the empirical studies that that you've worked on or you you, you your your colleagues have that um would be interesting to 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 share because this is where you know the the rubber hits the the uh, road so so to speak um yeah talk talk us through through some of those if if it's okay yeah so um we've been particularly interested in. Uh, sort of people's temporal preferences and in how they value well-being and you know experiences uh, in terms of where those things are located in their lives. So um, this the sort of area goes like way back. Um, even you know David Hume was talking about this um, back, way 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 back in the day. Um, but uh, just over the last, I guess, 20 years, um, interest has really um, uh, been kind of uh, peaked around these kinds of things. So, of course, in in economics and psychology, there's a massive literature, or like massive literature about uh, sort of temporal discounting. And that literature is kind of focused on uh, future stuff. So there are all these questions about um, how you and I um, accord value to well-being or experiences depending on like whether they're now or whether they're tomorrow or whether they're you know how far into the future they are and of course we know from the gazillions of experiments that have been undertaken by economists and psychologists that uh, you and I tend to discount the value of things the further into the future they go so the thing that you will you know quite highly value if you get it you'll value somewhat less if tomorrow's self gets it and less still if it's the self after and so on and so forth and we can we can create uh, an actual you know discount function that maps how much you value that thing depending on where it is in the future uh so we we um at the center for time we're kind of interested a bit more broadly in not just um how you think about future stuff but also like how how do you think about things uh, both past and future. So there's a as a story that one of my colleagues who um, recently passed away, uh, he tells, it's like a meant to be a little kind of um, thought experiment. So the idea is um, you wake up in hospital and you're a bit croggy uh, in the moment that you wake up and uh, a nurse walks past and you're like, well, what is going on here, man? And the nurse says, uh, yeah, so unfortunately, um, we've at in this moment we've lost your notes. So, 
but here's here's what we do know. Uh, we know that either um, yesterday you had a a very painful procedure. It was like a ten hour long procedure, and you had to, you were largely awake for it. Like it was it was bad. It was you know a lot of pain, uh, and it was yesterday. Or you have to have a procedure which is the same amount of uh, pain per hour, but it's only like two hours or something, and it's going to be tomorrow. So the procedure is either 24 hours ago or in 24 hours. Uh, and here's the thing. We don't know we don't know which of these is the case. We don't know whether you've just had it or whether you're going to have it. Uh, and so you're supposed to reflect on this little thought experiment of kind of waking up in hospital um, in this thing, and you're supposed to ask yourself, you know, the nurse goes off to get this information, like to find your file, sure. and you're supposed to ask yourself, okay, when when the nurse comes back, what am I hoping to find out? Am I hoping to find out that I had 10 hours of painful surgery yesterday or that I'm, I'm up for two hours of painful surgery tomorrow? And um, the, the prediction that my colleague uh, made about this is that people will in general – prefer to learn that they already had the surgery yes. rather than going to have it. And this is kind of notable, right? Because if you already had it, it was 10 hours. And if you're going to have it, it was two hours. So like if you already had it, it was five times worse than if you're going to have it in the future. And But he predicted that people would still uh, prefer the past much worse surgery than the future less bad surgery. Uh, but this hadn't really been tested. Um, so... Uh, it was a kind of prediction that people made, uh, but we didn't really know. It sounded pretty plausible, but no one, no, no one had really done any work here. And we thought it would be kind of nice to know if that's if if that's true. Pe will people, in fact, have that preference? Because that's uh, really interesting. Because most of us uh, make so many assumptions, and the idea of 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 science is to actually say, "Let's test it." Right. Um, because you know, in my mind, I'm like, it wouldn't matter if you said to me. It was a thousand hour long procedure, day after day after day after day. We gave you sleep, but every day you woke up, we we you know prodded and poked, and we didn't give you anesthetic and da da. da. I'd be like, yeah, a thousand hours that has passed uh, versus one hour of that in the future. Um, I know which one I'm picking, but it's important that all of this is empirically tested. So so because our assumptions are you know often wrong. Often wrong, they or, are often or, wrong. or there's more yeah. to understand about it. It's not just one mechanism at play. There's there's other things to consider. Yeah. So there was that. So there was that sort of initial um, case. So we wanted to know whether he was right about that. Uh, but also, um, there are a bunch of other predictions that he and other philosophers had sort of made. So uh, one prediction was that. Uh, we would we would prefer the pain to be in the past rather than the future when it came to our own pains and pleasures. So exactly the case that you were just describing, um, that we're going to prefer that we're going to prefer yesterday's longer operation to tomorrow's shorter one. But he also thought that if I'm making a decision about where I prefer your pains, that that will not be true. So imagine, so imagine for some reason, um, I, let, let's imagine I, you know, I like you. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I do like you, but like, like so let's imagine that, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of invested in your well being. Uh, and someone says to me, look, uh, Christy, do you have a preference about where this other person that you care about, where their pains are located. So um, it can either be that you had a painful operation yesterday that was 10 hours long or that you are going to have one tomorrow that's two hours. And I'm being asked to form a preference over where your operation is going to be, right? Uh, so philosophers had predicted that, interestingly, in the case in which I'm forming preferences over the location of your operation, uh, I won't care where it is. Or actually, better, uh, in the case where the operations are the same length yesterday versus today, I won't care where they are. But in the case in which the operation yesterday is longer than the operation tomorrow, I'll actually prefer that you have the shorter operation tomorrow to the longer operation yesterday. So they thought that uh, when it comes to my own um, pleasure than pains, I'm going to prefer more pain yesterday to less pain tomorrow. But when it comes to my preferences over your pleasures and pains, I'll just prefer that you have less pain. So I won't care yeah. where your pain is. I'll just be like, look, obviously I prefer 
that he has a shorter operation tomorrow to a longer one yesterday. Like, why would I inflict an additional eight hours of suffering on the dude, right? Yeah. Uh, yep. That was that was the prediction in that case. Uh, and there were some also some predictions about things that were not um, pains and pleasures. So there was a kind of prediction what's, that. What's interesting with that one, sorry to jump in. What's interesting with that one is uh, if we ask the question, for your pain and you know past versus future and then immediately follow that so the person's thinking in the same way about another person has that been tested or or, or, or the, the the test is done separately where a group of people are asked you know you're in the center and you know past or present and a, and a separate group now is just asked without any priming or anything ju- ju- just saying Hey, you've got a friend. They're going to have a two-hour operation. Um, do you mind whether it's before or after? Because um, I know when when you put yourself in that, you, you know, you 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 then touch base with that. But when you don't put yourself in it, you know, you you're just like because as you say, it makes sense. You just want less pain. Period. It, it would that doesn't the, the all the factors don't mean because we're we're just trying to avoid from that compassion point of view, from that love point of view, caring. So just less is better versus time is better. Like if, if we ask someone, would you like your family member to have had the procedure passed or the procedure coming? Does it still apply there that, that we don't care? Uh, so, yeah, the... The first prediction about um, what we prefer about our own pleasures and pains uh, was largely supported by the very, we've run a bunch of empirical studies and it's not everyone. So it's, it's not that there's a uniform. We're looking for averages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but most people, a, a clear majority of people wanted the pain yesterday. Not yesterday, tomorrow. for sure. Um, and they continued to want that to be the case even when the pain yesterday was larger than the pain tomorrow. In fact, we yeah. we got that result even when it was a 10 to 1. <laughs> um, but um, no, the prediction about other people was not supported. So the prediction was that when it comes to other people, um, we'll just try and minimise pain. We be, want yeah, to be sensitive yeah. to where it is. And that turned out not to be true. So um, people... It's not quite as strong a preference as in the the, the first personal case, but people uh, treat other people's pleasures and pains much the same the way they treat their own. So uh, when I'm asked whether I prefer that you already had the painful procedure or that you are going to have a somewhat less painful procedure, uh, most people still res- you know still prefer that you have the more painful procedure yesterday than the less painful one tomorrow. So that was... Uh, there had been widespread agreement that people wouldn't have that preference when it comes to other people, and that was um, decisively not found to be the case. Okay, so so uh, I'm, I'm a little bit confused now. Does that mean when when we projected to the other person, uh, we did a similar to ourselves, or we actually swapped it? We, 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 oh, we like, do the same. We do it we, the same. As oh, so we do felt. the same. Okay, yeah. so we do. So we do take that. We we, we still put ourselves in the picture somewhat of, of, of being able to see the the um, the time of saying I can allocate if it's in the past I don't have to feel that again and if it's in the past for a for a family member they don't have to feel that pain we, we so we still apply the same I suppose rationale well we don't know in theory we don't know what the rationale is yeah, yeah, so my apologies. We, know, yeah, yeah. we treat the case as the same maybe it's because it's the same i mean that, that's a pl- it's a plausible hypothesis that it's the same rationale but i can't sure. um confirm that because we haven't yeah we don't sort of done yeah. yeah yeah wow wow um before i let you go can you can you take me through one more cuz this is so fascinating <laughs> uh so because I can, I can see here on Phil Papers, by the way, there's uh, uh, at this moment 2,766,528 entries. Right. Yep. That sounds uh, about right. There's yeah. a lot. You know, that's, that's fantastic. A lot. 
there's a lot, but they're pretty well keyworded. So um, it's they are. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. But there's still plenty um, in all of them, you know, whether it's, you know, philosophy and religion, philosophy and action, oh yeah. metaphysics, metaphilosophy, metaethics, normative ethics, you know, you name it, philosophy of mathematics. Yep. Everything's in there, you know. Yep, everything is, yes. Yeah, no, it's um, it's a very extensive um, uh, site, which is fantastic because while not everybody uploads uh, pre-proofs of their papers, so there will be some stuff that's still behind a journal paywall. A lot of people do, so it's um, it's a super useful resource. Uh, yeah, so other, other empirical um, things we found, uh, we found that um, people have much stronger preferences about bad stuff than about good stuff. So uh, in like the pain case, people are like, yeah, look, I'm signing up to have 10 times more pain as long as it's been passed, all right, for themselves. Uh, we haven't done any more than 10. Like we haven't we haven't tried to figure out like how how, how much bad people will um, sign up for. But we know it's at least 10 to 1 that most people are like, yeah, 10 times more pain is fine as long as it's a past self who's suffering it. That's not true of pleasures. So with pleasures, um, once you get to a 10 to 1 ratio, people will prefer more pleasure in the past to in the future. So oh, uh, wow. uh, they will they they will prefer more future pleasure to past pleasure, but the ratio gets much closer. So when it's two to one, people will prefer um twice as much uh people won't prefer people won't prefer twice as much pleasure in the past as the future but they will prefer um 10 times as 10 much times. yeah so the, the 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 people are kind of um differentially sensitive to bad things right so um they become more what we call time neutral when it's pleasures that are um up for grabs. So that's also kind of interesting that. That is um, so fascinating that we completely flip it on its head once you once you change it. We, we say, yeah, if, if I had 10 times the, the amount of good in the, in, in the past, that's a life worth living, you know, things must have been good and I, I'll take pleasure out of that now knowing that. Uh, but if it's kind of like pain, I take pleasure out of it now that it's past. Right, uh, right, right, right. It's also interesting because it says, it actually says I'll take pleasure in, in in that it's past without knowing what the pain was. I just know I had pain. Um uh, right. rather than I'm uh that you'll know exactly what it is and I'll describe what that pain was and you know, and I imagine it would be very different if we said it was physical pain versus if it was an emotional pain, you know. Um uh, yeah, maybe that, that would be interesting. Um that would be an interesting kind of follow-up study actually because we haven't uh all of the studies have looked at not not always physical pain sometimes they're kind of just unpleasant things like having to eat nasty stuff but they are all in some sense sort of physical sensation based rather than kind of you know um uh trauma based things um so yeah there there could be some potentially interesting kind of follow-up work there to see what what kind of differences we get this is so fascinating. I, I could I could I could talk with you for hours uh, or, or or days if we're allowed to talk about time in that in that way. Um, there's so much resources here to 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 follow up on and and um, uh, yeah, I can't I can't thank you enough. What are you currently working on before I let you go? Um, so I've just finished a book on this kind of time preference stuff we were just talking about, kind of time preference stuff, um, and. What's yeah, the book? Can we? Can we? Is 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 it ready? Can we do a shout it's out? Not for ready. It or, it's not okay. ready. It's at the publisher, but it's not. It's not out. It cannot yet be um be purchased. But it will include all of these kind of empirical studies when it comes out. So we've done a bunch, and it's kind of uh it's working its way through those and trying to figure out uh what implications those have for the ways we kind of um should understand temporal preferences and for whether being the way we are is kind of rational or not. Well, if, if it's coming out soon, you, you're more than welcome to put a link on our, on, on our website as well. So that uh, readers can, can come back to this episode and, and, and find out more about it. So please, cool. please uh, shout, you know, shout out, reach out and we'll, we'll, we'll do that. But uh, uh, that sounds really exciting. Do you have a time frame when you think that might come out? 
Well, it's always hard to know because, uh, you know, philosophy books go to readers first and they give you copious comments about oh, all the things that they didn't gosh. find plausible. Ouch. And then you have to kind of make <laughs> lots of changes. And so it's always hard to know how long will the readers take and then how much time is it going to take me to fix things. So it's been at the publishers for a little while. I mean, I'm sort of hoping it might be out early next year, but, you know, these things, things move slow in the publication world, I find. <laughs> No, look, look, look forward to to hearing about it, and and uh, yeah, please, please do reach out when when that happens. We'll we'll pop it on that website. So, um, but uh, yeah, thank thank you so much, Christy. It's it's been it's been uh, such a pleasure and 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 fascinating to 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 talk through through this in in so many different ways. From I just think there's value in reflecting on this stuff. I think when you start thinking about time, it brings up values. It asks questions about the self identity. Uh, you know who we are, and all of these existential, potentially you know ex- existential things. Uh, I think have great value. You know that that if we hold them gently and thoughtfully, and and then actually enjoying it, it can guide what we do for those future selves and how we might you know do things today uh, or in the moment. And um, yeah, I can't I can't thank you enough. It, it, it's lovely to, to to mold and meld and 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 combine psychology with philosophy and and all the other sciences. I think that that's the probably the most fascinating and enjoyable things okay. had uh, others, you know, like evolutionary uh, uh, psychologists and, and others on on the show as well. Cause I, I think when we can have a conversation that, that goes over multiple disciplines uh, ha- has a lot more value to, to understand the world and, and ourselves. So yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's been a lot of fun. If you enjoyed this podcast, Please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review. Subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work, Come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.